This is a homily for the fourth Sunday of Easter. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. In the opening chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus is about to leave for Galilee, but before departing, he finds Philip and says, Follow me. The very first thing that Philip then does is to find Nathanael, and he says to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael is sceptical. From Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip replies, Come and see. That summons, Come and see, is addressed not only to Nathanael, but also to the reader of the fourth gospel. It is an invitation to discern, among other things, whether the Jesus whom the reader meets in the story that John is telling is, in fact, the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. As the plot of John's gospel unfolds, Jesus comes into conflict with religious authorities who charge him with violating the Sabbath. At the pool of Bethesda, Jesus had healed a man with an illness that had lasted 38 years. He then tells the man to get up, pick up your mat and walk around. The violation of the Sabbath lay not in the act of healing, but in the command given to the heel man to carry his mat. That act of carrying a load constituted a violation of the commandment that prohibits all work on the Sabbath. We're then told that the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he did things like this on the Sabbath. But Jesus responds to his detractors. You search the scriptures, believing that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness about me, and yet you are not willing to come to me to have life. So what Philip had told Nathanael was right. Jesus is the one of whom Moses, the law, and the prophets wrote. But here's an interesting aspect of John's Gospel. Although Jesus is the one of whom Moses, the law, and the prophets wrote, John's Gospel contains relatively few direct quotations from the Old Testament. If we tabulate John's Old Testament references, including allusions, and compare them to those of the Synoptic Gospels, the totals are striking. Matthew has 124 references or allusions. Mark has 70. Luke has 109. But John has only 27. What do we make of that? New Testament scholar John Hayes draws this conclusion. Just as John condenses the traditions of Jesus' healing and miracle-working activity down to a few selected episodes that are given more extended development than in the synoptic tradition, so also John focuses on a smaller number of Old Testament quotations. Precisely because there are relatively few quotations, each citation that does appear in John's uncluttered narrative assumes proportionately greater gravity as a pointer to Jesus' identity. John is the master of the carefully framed, luminous image that shines brilliantly against a dark canvas and lingers in the imagination. With that in mind... Let us turn to today's Gospel from chapter 10. Here we have a perfect example of one of John's luminous images that shine brightly against a dark canvas and lingers in the imagination. 
the image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. The Greek word translated here as good is kalos. It means beautiful in the sense of an ideal or model of perfection, rather than good in the sense of skilled. So Jesus is a trustworthy, authentic and faithful shepherd who tends and safeguards his sheep, unlike the hired men who flee whenever danger approaches. This image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd has influenced the way in which many Christian denominations refer to their leaders. Those in ministry are often called or referred to as pastors, which comes from the Latin word for shepherd. Ministerial care of the congregation is referred to as pastoral care. Throughout the Old Testament, God is repeatedly portrayed, metaphorically, as a shepherd. This is especially so in the Psalms, as you can see here. In Psalm 23, we pray, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me, he revives my soul. Psalm 74. Why, O God, have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger blaze at the sheep of your pasture? Remember your flock, which you claimed long ago, the tribe you redeemed to be your own possession, this mountain of Zion, where you made your dwelling. Psalm 79. Pay back to our neighbours seven times over the taunts with which they taunted you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give you thanks for ever and ever. From age to age we will recount your praise. In Psalm 80 we pray, O shepherd of Israel, hear us, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Psalm 95 O come, let us bow and bend low, let us kneel before the God who made us. For he is our God, and we the people who belong to his pasture, the flock that is led by his hand. And in Psalm 100, know that he, the Lord, is God. He made us, we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. However, the text which is undoubtedly the backdrop to this chapter of John's Gospel is chapter 34 of the prophet Ezekiel. Listen to the opening verses of chapter 34. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Shepherds, the Lord God says this, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves! Should not shepherds feed a flock? You feed on the milk, you clothe yourselves in the wool, you slaughter the fattest sheep, but you do not feed the flock. You have not made the weak sheep strong, or cared for the sick ones, or bandaged the injured ones. You have not brought back strays or looked for the lost. On the contrary, you have ruled them cruelly and harshly. By way of contrast, Jesus does make the weak strong. He does care for the sick ones. As we have already seen, when Jesus cures the man at the pool of Bethesda, the Jews are not rejoicing that a man who has suffered for 38 years is at last made well. They are more concerned about violations of the Sabbath. This scenario is virtually repeated in the chapter immediately preceding today's Gospel. Jesus cures a man born blind. The healing takes place in stages. Firstly, Jesus puts mud on the blind man's eyes. He then says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The man does as Jesus tells him. He washes in the pool of Siloam. And the man 
who was born blind can now see. When people ask how his eyes were opened, he tells them, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and was able to see. The Pharisees react in exactly the same way that people reacted when Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. They aren't rejoicing that a man who has been born blind can now see. They are instead more concerned about a violation of the Sabbath. Speaking of Jesus, they say, That man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. The violation of the Sabbath in this miracle story is the making of a paste with saliva. That was deemed to be work and therefore forbidden on the Sabbath. When they ask the man who had been blind what he had to say about Jesus, he replies, He is a prophet. The Jews refused to believe that the man truly had been blind and had come to see, so they sent for his parents. When his parents are interrogated, they replied, He is of age. Question him. The man is interrogated a second time, and the Jews again repeat the accusation that Jesus is a sinner. The man replies, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. This is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he will listen to him. The Jews are indignant and accuse the man himself of being a sinner. You were born holy in sin, and are you teaching us? They then drive the man out. The irony here is that the man born blind can now see but the authorities are descending further into darkness. This, of course, is a recurring motif in John's Gospel. Though the light has come into the world, people have shown that they prefer darkness to the light. So, we have the story of the cure of the man born blind just prior to today's Gospel. Let's have a quick look at what happens after today's Gospel. In chapter 11, Jesus is in the temple in Jerusalem, walking in the portico of Solomon. The Jews gather around him and ask, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us openly. So far, Jesus has been using figurative language. However, the image of the Good Shepherd is not the sentimental figure of later Christian piety. For the crowd assembled in the portico of Solomon, the image of the Good Shepherd was also political, because they would have made the association with the prophecy of Ezekiel. As we've already seen, the prophet, speaking in the name of God, scolded the leaders of Israel for failing to care properly for God's flock. They were selfish and careless shepherds who had allowed the sheep to be abused and scattered. And near the end of chapter 34, in verses 23 and 24, we read, I shall put over them one shepherd, my servant David, and put him in charge of them to pasture them. He will pasture them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, shall be their God, and my servant David will be ruler among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So in calling himself the Good Shepherd, Jesus is making a symbolic claim to be the new David, the restorer and ruler of Israel. And so the crowd now presses him 
for a more explicit declaration. Are you the anointed one or not? Jesus replies, taking up again the image of the shepherd and his sheep. The works I do in my Father's name witness to me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. And the works that Jesus has done have been those of the Good Shepherd. His works are works of healing and feeding, precisely what the Good Shepherd of Ezekiel chapter 34 promised to do for the flock. Jesus continues, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Note, the sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd and they follow him. Let me reflect upon that image for a moment. Being a shepherd at the time of Jesus was a full-time job. The shepherd watched over his flock, always on the lookout for fresh pasture and keeping an eye out for predators. At night time, the shepherd protected his sheep by leading them into a sheepfold, like the ones you can see here. If there was no gate, the shepherd would sleep lying across the entrance to the sheepfold. He quite literally became the gate to the sheepfold. Sometimes several shepherds would share the same sheepfold, even though that meant that the flocks would intermingle. How in the morning did they sort out whose sheep were whose? The journalist and pioneering travel writer H. V. Morton wrote a fascinating book in 1934 entitled In the Steps of the Master. It is an account of his visit to the Holy Land before the establishment of the modern state of Israel. The modern state of Israel was established in 1948. Morton had observed some Palestinian shepherds tending their sheep. At night time, two shepherds ushered their sheep not into a sheepfold but into a cave. Here's how Morton describes what happened in the morning. Sometimes the shepherd talks to the sheep in a loud sing-song voice using a weird language unlike anything I have ever heard in my life. Early one morning I saw an extraordinary sight not far from Bethlehem. Two shepherds had evidently spent the night with their flocks in a cave. The sheep were all mixed together and the time had come for the shepherds to go in different directions. One of the shepherds stood some distance from the sheep and began to call. First one, then another, then four or five animals ran towards him, and so on, until he had counted his whole flock. This image of the shepherd calling his sheep is the background to Jesus calling his disciples his sheep. They are the sheep who listen to his voice and follow him. But here in the portico of Solomon, the Jews refuse to listen to his voice. When Jesus tells them that the Father and I are one, they take up stones to stone him. Before continuing, let me make a comment on John's use of the term the Jews. When John's Gospel refers to the Jews, we should not understand this to be a reference to the Jewish people as a whole at the time of Jesus, and certainly not to all Jews throughout history. After all, Jesus himself was a Jew, as were all of his original followers. In the fourth gospel, this term frequently, though not always, designates a specific group of authorities concentrated in Jerusalem who opposed Jesus and his message and sought to suppress the movement that had formed around him. It is this group who failed to embody the care and compassion of the Good Shepherd. They cannot rejoice in the healing of a man born blind, nor of a man healed of an illness he suffered for 38 years. In both cases, their concern is about a possible violation of the Sabbath. 
the strongest opposition to Jesus comes from those who are committed to a rigorous interpretation of the law from those who are duly charged with protecting the integrity and the sacredness of God's revealed truth. But, according to John chapter 12, verse 43, their motives are also self-serving. They loved human glory more than the glory of God. They are the hired hands of today's gospel. They abandoned the sheep as soon as they see a wolf coming. As I was reflecting on the reaction of those opposed to Jesus in John's Gospel, I couldn't help making a connection with the writings of the psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist. In his book, The Master and His Emissary, McGilchrist writes about how our brain functions. He focuses especially upon the two hemispheres of the brain, the left brain and the right brain. He points out that the left and right hemispheres are each involved in the process of perception, but each has its own distinctive take on the world. They are two different ways of attending to the world. The right hemisphere focuses on the big picture, the gestalt. So, for example, if we were listening to a piece of music, the right hemisphere takes in the work as a whole, in this case, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But the left hemisphere of the brain has a much narrower focus. It focuses upon pieces of information in isolation. In this case, it focuses on individual notes in isolation from their context within the symphony. But a symphony is more than a collection of notes. The music is not just in the notes. It's also in the silences or gaps between the notes. Each note is transformed by the context in which it lies. McGilchrist gives an example of a bird scavenging for food. Birds also have brains like ours, with left and right hemispheres that function as ours do. So when a bird is scavenging for food, the left brain focuses on a potential meal, a worm on the soil below. But the bird's brain must distinguish the worm from nearby twigs, which, from a distance, might look a little bit like worms. But the worm is the sole focus of the left brain's attention. But the right brain is more concerned with the big picture. What else is happening that I need to be aware of? After all, in catching a worm, I don't want to become another predator's food. If the bird focuses solely on the worm, it may well become a snack for the eagle that is looking down from above. We would never experience the beauty of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony by examining each note in isolation, one after another. The beauty is in the whole that the notes and the silence make together. Each note becomes transformed by the context in which it lies. We can all be guilty of focusing on our own narrow view of reality and totally missing the big picture, or in this case, focusing solely on one note and totally missing the beauty of the symphony. That would happen if the left hemisphere dominated our perception of reality. McGilchrist points out that global attention, courtesy of the right hemisphere, comes first, not just in time, but it takes precedence in our sense of what it is we are attending to. So, for example, we would normally see the image here as an H composed of E's and a 4 composed of 8's. If the perception of the right hemisphere were to be lost, as happens in schizophrenia, then the figure becomes just a mass of E's and 8's. But McGilchrist tells us that 
the attentional hierarchy can also be inverted in certain circumstances in normal individuals. Such a condition results in seeing a mass of E's and 8's, or hearing isolated notes rather than a symphony. McGilchrist describes the essentially self-referring nature of the world of the left hemisphere. It deals with what it already knows, the world it has made for itself. The opponents of Jesus in John's Gospel, his most vocal and consistent critics, had a very narrow and legalistic view of God's kingdom. They wanted to erect restrictive barriers, granting access only to people who observed the Torah and the oral tradition as strictly and rigorously as they did. God's kingdom is for people who are just like us. They had a very narrowly focused, self-referring, left-brain perception of God's kingdom. All bureaucracies can become self-referring, obsessed with the empire they have made for themselves and hostile to any forces that want to change the comfortable routines they have established. The 1980s TV series Yes Minister and then Yes Prime Minister were brilliant satires on government bureaucracy. Jim Hacker is the Minister for the Department of Administrative Affairs. His principal private secretary is Bernard Woolley, and the permanent secretary of Hacker's department is Sir Humphrey Appleby. One episode, ironically entitled The Compassionate Society, is about St Edward's, a newly constructed hospital in northern London. It already has a staff of 342 administrators, plus 170 porters, cleaners, laundry workers, gardeners, cooks, and so forth. But no medical staff. Hacker's private secretary, Bernard, explains that, unfortunately, due to government cutbacks, there was no money left for medical staff. Hacker realises how bad this will seem if the press get hold of it. So Sir Humphrey is told to sort the matter out with his opposite number in the Department of Health and Social Security, Sir Ian Whitechurch. The two department heads meet. So, why is your minister interested in St Edward's Hospital? Well, he's apparently greatly concerned that it has no patients. How could there be patients when it has no nursing staff? We've found at the DHSS that it takes time to get things going. First of all, you have to sort out the smooth running of the hospital. Having patients around would be no help at all. They'd just be in the way. Uh, We are going to get some patients into St Edward's uh, eventually, aren't we? It's possible. It's certainly our present intention. In a year or two. Probably. The Compassionate Society, indeed. A perfect example of bureaucracy looking after its own interests. Like the hired hand in today's gospel, they lack any relationship with the people they are supposed to be serving. By way of contrast, The Good Shepherd knows his own, and they know him. But more than that, he lays down his life for his sheep. That might seem like a highly improbable scenario for us in the 21st century, but it was not unheard of in Palestine, even up until comparatively recent times. William McClure Thompson was an American missionary working in Syria. In 1860, he published an account of a pilgrimage he made to the Holy Land a few years earlier in 1857. This was, of course, well before the establishment of the modern state of Israel. Palestine was then part of the Ottoman Empire. Thompson's book, entitled The Land and the Book, proved to be enormously popular in America. 
it was only outsold by Uncle Tom's cabin. He writes of the fate of one shepherd in the Galilee region, somewhere between the city of Tiberias by the Lake of Galilee and Mount Tabor, the traditional site of the Transfiguration. He writes, And when the thief and the robber come, and come they do, the faithful shepherd has often to put his life in his hands to defend his flock. I have known more than one case where he had literally to lay it down in the contest. A poor faithful fellow last spring between Tiberius and Tabor, instead of fleeing, actually fought three Bedouin robbers until he was hacked to pieces with their kanjars and died among the sheep he was defending. In the Good Shepherd Discourse, Jesus says five times that the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verses 11, 15, 17, and twice in verse 18. As Jesus tells his disciples during the Last Supper discourse, a man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. True love does not turn inwards to satisfy its own desires. It is the ability to turn outwards towards others. Our English word love has a vast semantic range, but the test of authentic love is sacrifice. And Jesus, the Good Shepherd, makes that supreme sacrifice for his sheep. We have here a striking image of salvation. The one who saves is not a mighty warrior who comes in military array, but rather a lowly shepherd.